Hello and welcome to Upfront. I am Kang Tae-ri. President of the International Olympic Committee, Thomas Bach, has recently revealed the Olympic Agenda 2020 that introduces the idea of allowing multiple cities to jointly stage events. And this has raised concerns that such idea could be pushed and applied to the 2018 Winter Olympics in Korea's Pyeongchang. With the IOC delegation in Korea this week for a check on preparation progress in Pyeongchang, today we're going to... Uh, uh, go up front on this uh, controversy surrounding the 2018 Winter Games. And as always, we have a great panel of experts to go up front uh, on this topic with me. First of all, to my left, uh, Mr. Kim Eun-yong, former IOC Vice President, uh, who is a legendary uh, sports figure here in Korea. Welcome to our program. Thank you. And to my right, <coughs> Professor Chun Am Gi from Sung Myung Women's <coughs> University. Uh, he's going to talk about sports diplomacy as well as uh, human resource development in the field of sports. Welcome. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And of course, Mr. Ji Jung Su, co president of the Sustainable Development Global Network. Uh, good to have you with us again. Thank you, my pleasure. Now, before we get started, uh, let's first to get a recap of what Olympic Agenda 2020 entails, as well as what the debate is all about. The Olympics, one of the world's major sports festivals, are set to face some big changes. The International Olympic Committee has recently revealed its first reform plan in 15 years. IOC President Thomas Bach has announced the strategic roadmap for the future of Olympics, dubbed Olympic Agenda 2020. The reform plan entails 40 recommendations, including 20 proposals regarding the Games and 20 others on management of the IOC. However, the new reform plan is raising concerns as it promotes the idea of simplifying the bidding process as well as allowing joint hosting by cities and countries. The IOC is pursuing the changes because it's become economically more challenging for a single city or country to host the Games. Hosting the Games used to be considered a symbol of enhanced national power but now, because of the heavy price tag for new construction projects, security and personnel expenses, the number of bidding countries has decreased. Sweden's Stockholm, Poland's Krakow and Norway's Oslo all have given up hosting the 2022 Olympic Winter Games out of concern that the Olympics would be a financial burden. And Agenda 2020 has certainly come timely for Pyeongchang, the 2018 Winter Olympic host. If the Olympic Agenda 2020 uh, is approved, uh, then enter into discussions uh, with uh, regard to the implementation. Uh, this uh, can uh, lead uh, to uh, um, lesser capacities uh, with regard uh, to, uh, to different uh, venues, uh, like in Tokyo, uh, can uh, in include uh, uh, venue changes. Uh, this uh, can uh, lead uh, to uh, um, lesser capacities uh, with regard uh, to, uh, to different uh, venues. With Olympic Agenda 2020 unanimously adopted by IOC members, all eyes now turn to whether the reform plan will bring any changes to the upcoming 2018 Winter Games. We only have three years to go until the 2018 Pyeongchang Olympic Games. Today's Upfront discusses challenges ahead for the Pyeongchang Olympics and ways to better prepare for the world's sports festival. So why do you think the IOC has released this new Olympic Agenda 2020? What do you think they wanted to achieve here? Maybe I'll uh, start off with you, Mr. Kim. No, IOC is engulfed in what they call commercialism, professionalism, gigantism, and all kinds of isms. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe Olympic ideals which are supposed to be dedicated to education of the youth and the contribution to peace, mm -hmm. not maybe destroyed, but might be damaged a little bit, and they have to rebuild 
incorrect position on these Olympic ideals in 21st century. Mm -hmm. And uh, Baha, who took over IOC uh, last year, I think, uh, he has to do a lot of things, and Olympic agenda is some kind of reform uh, procedure, mm -hmm. which is nothing more than, not necessarily this uh, sharing uh, mm. sport events and so on, but it has a lot of things like uh, right. Other yes, reform measures Olympic well. Channel, okay. etc. So do you think, what, what's your stance on what brought out this uh, reform measures at this point? And do you think it was a targeting Pyeongchang in a way? Uh, <coughs> before um, we talk about um, the uh, <coughs> Uh, the Pyeongchang takes the agenda 2020 or mm -hmm. not, I think we need to take a look at the political context mm -hmm. first. Uh, just uh, let's focus on um, Thomas Bach's first eight-year term. Mm -hmm. It uh, started already, his term started already. Uh, I believe he mm -hmm. wants to show uh, some kind of achievement within his first eight-year term. Right. And uh, mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, Agenda 2020 includes all his, uh, um, um, his, um, his achievement. Mm -hmm. So it, it's in there. So he wants to show some kind of short-term achievement within his AD, first eight-year term. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's talk about the cost part of it. There are support funds coming from the IOC as well as the central government here and as well as obviously the local government. Mm -hmm. How are the costs shared for this event. Anybody? Uh, I believe they uh, have an agreement uh, recently. Mm -hmm. uh, central government pays about 50% of the uh, uh, building new venues okay. and 25% 20, each mm -hmm. for uh, organizing committee mm -hmm. and uh, Gangwon province. Uh -huh. So um, they have an agreement. But uh, the Gangwon uh, council, mm -hmm. uh, what I heard is they rejected the agreement oh. um, uh, because of you know, you know, expected deficit, the right. great amount mm -hmm. of money they can have after the Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, you know, I could say uh, we, go, you know, we went to another stage. Mm -hmm. So public consensus should be the issue first. Mm. Well, this, so speaking of ways to economize, like you said, let's talk about the opening and closing ceremony venues. These uh, venues are expensive, and it, these are not even uh, sports facilities, and I hear they cost 130 billion won. We're talking about over 100 million dollars. <coughs> Is it worth it? I mean, we're not going to be even using these okay. facilities after the games. Okay. Some Olympic Games opening ceremony are indoors. Some Olympic Games outdoors. Mm -hmm. uh, in front of a jumping tower, uh, like uh, Lilyhammer was outdoor, Albertville was outdoor, uh, Nagano was outdoor, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, Calgary was indoor, but you don't need indoor to, to, to be torn down later. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the Asian Games opening, and this is technically speaking. Mm -hmm. IOC is never demanding you to have this and that, mm -hmm. as long as you are within the uh, scope of rules and the charter. Maybe you can organize uh, as you did uh, for Asian Winter Games and uh, National Games. Mm -hmm. Of course, should be better, like Nagano. Uh, in front of Jump Tower, you could have uh, opening ceremony. Mm -hmm. This is technically speaking, but mm -hmm. politically speaking, I don't know what uh, people in Korea uh, would like to see and spend money. That mm -hmm. is beyond my... Uh, well, mm -hmm. U.S. the Olympic <coughs> Committee uh, mm -hmm. decided to uh, Boston as uh, the city for hosting 2024 Summer mm -hmm. Olympic. Mm -hmm. And the Boston Organization Committee uh, selected two ways yeah. to lessen the burden on the citizens. One to build temporary stadium. So after the uh -huh. Olympic, they can tone down mm. the stadium. And the second one is to uh, <coughs> actively uh, have fundraising campaign mm. with the, the Fortune 500 companies to support 
the expenses for mm -hmm. the Olympic. Mm -hmm. Now, at this point, let's listen into what the governor of Kangwondo Province, where Pyeongchang, this resort town, is located, has to say about the heavy price tag of hosting the games. Up front, had a chance to meet with the governor, Choi Moon Sun. Take a listen. It is natural to have concerns over the financial burden as all the Winter Olympics have had a deficit. The main cause of the deficit is the expenses needed to maintain the facilities after the Olympic Games end. In order to minimize the economic burden, we have tried to avoid unnecessary construction of the stadiums and also design plans to better utilize the facilities after the Olympics. Opening and closing ceremony halls are the ones that have raised the most concerns, as they should be big enough to accommodate about 40 to 50,000 people, but they would become useless after the ceremony. So, in order to make better use of those halls, we have cooperated with Seoul National University Pyeongchang campus to transform them into an anti-aging cluster, a center that helps people keep their youth and health. Part of the facilities will be transformed into a hotel and the rest will become the anti-aging cluster. But we should take the economic feasibility into consideration. We are expecting to have about 2 million guests during the Olympic period, which is almost equal to the number of tourists that visit Kangwondo province for a year. In order to maintain such an achievement, it is important to build a better infrastructure for tourism. We will improve various sectors including accommodations, food, network, interpretation, transportation and services. And we have also prepared cultural and art performances, which can be a great source to attract more foreign tourists. All right, so we all like this uh, idea of building an anti-aging uh, facility there. So the government is talking about tearing down these facilities, uh, like you were talking about the example of Boston, but it's a little different because mm -hmm. in the beginning, Boston is building temporarily built stadiums to begin with. So is this a viable solution to tear down the facilities because the maintenance cost is too big? I believe it, it, co it produces cost as well because, you know, deconstruction needs cost as well. So mm. um, I would suggest rather um, transformational facilities. That's uh -huh. the, that could be the uh, alternatives mm. uh, because um, <coughs> if we seek for uh, private investment, mm -hmm. the place and the facility, facilities itself uh, should be attractive enough to have that uh, private investment. Right. So um, before, before doing that, uh, we need to open, we need to make it transformational to accept uh, diverse needs from mm -hmm. diverse companies, diverse private companies. Mm -hmm. So I would say uh, trans transformation uh, for the uh, facilities mm -hmm. that uh, could be a prerequisite mm -hmm. for um, uh, after utilization, uh, you know, for the utilization of uh, facilities. Mm -hmm. Well, it, that's very good idea. However, though, I think reality-wise, we don't have that much time. One, that's that true. in terms mm -hmm. of feasibility study and attracting investors coming in to do that. So I, uh, we, we, we have very, very uh, small the amount of time to do, to do the construction. So uh, I think the Boston decided to do this the temporary facility because of just cost saving reason. Mm -hmm. And when it, this facility, 40,000 people can accommodate it in this stadium in, turn, in order to maintain that facility, that would cost about I mean, 100 million dollars within mm -hmm. 10 years. So something that we got to make a very <coughs> radical decision what to do. That's true, that's true. Okay, mm. so uh, now let's uh, at this point to get another voice in this uh, conversation and get an idea on how to better utilize uh, sports facilities for uh, mega sporting events like this. Uh, joining us is Professor Victor Matheson from College of the uh, Holy Cross. Professor, thank you so much for joining this conversation. Uh, my first question, walk us through the whole package of infrastructure that's needed to host such a large-scale global sporting event like Winter Olympic Games? Well, the Winter Olympics are a very costly event, mainly because it requires very specialized uh, sports infrastructure in particular. First of all, you need bobsled run uh, and luge run. Uh, this is something that most winter resorts do not have. 
Uh, you of course need a ski facility. You need some. Uh, you need some Nordic skiing as well. But you also then need large indoor facilities for things like uh, speed skating and of course uh, figure skating and hockey. Uh, you often will have large uh, uh, ski resorts. Uh, will have the skiing facilities in place, but most of them don't have the arenas. And of course, large cities. Uh, that have the indoor arenas often don't have ski resorts uh, nearby. So that makes it a fairly expensive proposition for most countries. Yes, uh, expensive uh, propositions indeed. Now, that's the hardware part of the package. Now, what would be some of the other expenses that don't necessarily come at the top of the bill, but if combined to make a big difference on the total sum? Right. So if you look at Sochi, for example, the last host, uh, they spent about $1 billion. Almost all of that wasn't on ski resorts and uh, luge runs. It was on general infrastructure. Again, getting uh, housing and hotel space for maybe 50,000 guests, uh, getting uh, the type of uh, transportation networks that allow you to get from your major uh, transportation hubs into the city. Of course, that's one of the large expenses that uh, Korea is engaging in. Uh, rail, for example, to get from the large population centers into the resort itself. We know that uh, Sydney for the Summer Games spent $250 million in the year 2000, but Greece just four years later, point billion dollars. And of course, uh, that was Greece happening after the terrorist events of September 11th, 2001, while Sydney got away for a relatively cheap uh, cost uh, kind of in the pre-terrorism age in some ways. All right, so expenses for security as well. Uh, Got to leave it there for now. Thank you so much, Professor Matheson, there joining us for this conversation. Now, so he was talking about all these uh, different items on the bill that uh, Pyeongchang is going to get at the end of the Games. So co-hosting the Olympics that we touched on briefly, I, I want to get your stance on this idea where co-host no co-host, neutral, where do you stand? Um, it's very tough, it's very complicated to uh, have a national consensus to, uh, you know, for co-hosting. Uh, however, if we just, uh, you know, focus on economic cost, uh, we can think of uh, co domestic co-hosting mm -hmm. within Gangwon province or beyond the Gangwon province. However, um, as I said, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be very tough and complicated. It needs a very complicated process mm -hmm. to have a national consensus. And also, we need to persuade the, the, the public as well as the government and sure. uh, you know, Gangwon province as well. So mm -hmm. uh, I would say, you know, from the eco economic perspective, mm -hmm. uh, we need to consider uh, co-hosting. However, mm -hmm. As I said, a realistic perspective, mm -hmm. from the realistic perspective, it's, it's pretty tough. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the sharing with uh, uh, the North Korea or Japan is uh, <laughs> too much right. of a problem. But, exactly. but I think in terms of the sharing with uh, another city in Korea, whereas Muju mm -hmm. is one of uh, alternatives mm -hmm. we can entertain. Okay. If, if, if Gangwon province agrees. Yes, right. If Gangwon <laughs> province agrees. Yeah. But, uh, uh, we all think uh, sharing or co-hosting, mm -hmm. whatever you call, with uh, outsiders are out. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, uh, the but, uh, mm -hmm. some people started to talk about sharing one event or two events with mm -hmm. uh, North Korea, but uh, no. ideally, maybe politically, mm -hmm. uh, it's very good to talk, but mm -hmm. uh, in practicality of course it's up to IOC but uh, even to have two three sports you have to have everything same way right broadcast center press yeah. center security transportation airport arrival departure have to open you know mm -hmm. whole country and who will pay for all these things yes. so uh, it will be not so easy to do that you can talk about it mm -hmm. but uh, it won't be easy even mm -hmm. if IOC agrees mm -hmm. and welcome. Mm -hmm. So, well, but, uh, domestic sharing, which is very good idea, mm -hmm. but I don't know if uh, uh, Do uh, even called by Wonju people for mm -hmm. bringing ice hockey 
from Kangnung, uh, it's not so easy. So I don't know if, uh, how they can uh, adjust this. Mm. Another point we, uh, we, uh, we, we, need to <coughs> we need to take a look is uh, the construction already started. Right. So mm. About 12.5% of the one venue mm. already done so far. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to spend the deconstruction fees, deconstruction cost as well. Mm. So uh, let's go back to you know, political context. I believe you know, IOC is desperate for uh, Agenda 2020, mm -hmm. which means uh, they are very sensitive for the deficit Right. Um, you know, produced uh, in Winter Olympic Games. So they want to decrease the deficit or mm -hmm. uh, they want to make a you know, prop, even profit. They want to make, make a profit. However, it's very tough. So uh, that's the point uh, we can uh, take advantage, mm -hmm. which means uh, there must be room for another negotiation mm -hmm. for uh, more funding from IOC. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, if we, uh, if we need to spend the uh, uh, you know, deconstruction fee, mm -hmm. then if you know, we can negotiate to, uh, for the deconstruction cost with the IOC, mm -hmm. if they you know, want us to accept you know, co domestic co-hosting. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But um, you know, it's, it's tough as well. Mm -hmm. so, um, the some are actually raising the possibility of South Korea co-hosting the 2020 Summer Olympics mm -hmm. with Japan, sort of like a win-win situation, give and take. No, you're already shaking your head, so I guess not. That's what Korean press said, I said. Right, okay. Yeah. All I also want is to have good preparations. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Now, uh, the Pyeongchang Organizing Committee of the 2018 Winter Olympic Games is not uh, really going for this idea of uh, co-hosting the Olympics, obviously, saying there is no point in discussing this uh, matter. And that construction of all competition venues has already begun, as we've uh, talked about. Now, we had a chance to meet with Mr. Kwak Gyeongjin, a Secretary General of the Pyeongchang 2018 Organizing Committee, to hear more about the progress made so far. Uh, we have designed the basic plans for the Olympics so far, but from this year, we are planning to actually carry out those plans. So we are now working on establishing detailed strategies to implement. We have focused on building infrastructure, stadiums and traffic networks so far. But from the end of this year, we are going to focus more on managing the stadiums. All the stadiums for the Olympics have been under construction and others, including the training center for the athletes, will begin construction within this year. So all the facilities needed for the Olympics will be established by the end of 2016 or the beginning of 2017. It might feel like it is a little bit late, but we have galvanized efforts to finish the construction on time. I believe a lot of other nations, including Southeast Asia, will show a lot of interest in Pyeongchang, as the city has gone through a lot of new experiments in the field of Winter Olympics despite all the challenges. The preparation process will be concluded within one or two years. As we don't have much time left, now is time for all the stakeholders to reach an agreement to better prepare for the Olympic Games. Now, uh, talking about uh, the Pyeongchang Olympic Games, environmental issues we cannot uh, neglect here. Um, Denver, for example, in the U.S., obviously, turned down the Olympics because they did not want this massive destruction of wildlife habitat that it has. And, of course, uh, Germany has also um, given up on their Olympic dreams because of the expected environmental damage. Where does Korea stand in all this? Is this big enough of an issue that we need to consider, maybe down the road, not necessarily for 2018? Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, it's in inevitable mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, uh, environmental impairment or environmental damage. So, and we, we, we also need to uh, uh, consider it with the economic uh, aspect as well. Because if we build new venues in Pyeongchang, mm -hmm. I think environmental impairment is inevitable. Then uh, I would say um, civic organizations mm -hmm. or civic ombudsmen mm -hmm. or diverse perspectives should be included in decision-making process. 
then mm. uh, we can uh, resist at least a, a certain part. Uh, we can resist, you know, Im environmental mm -hmm. or um, uh, impairment. Mm -hmm. That's the, uh, the, I think that's the, uh, one of the strategies mm. to protect the environment. Mm. And I think this is the one of the reasons why that Muju co-hosting this uh, these games with uh, Muju, especially when it comes to ski games, mm -hmm. uh, keeps on coming up because it already has the ski facilities. Is that a viable solution at this point for the environmental reasons? Well, uh, certainly that was what the professor said. In terms of the environmental issue, the, certainly the, 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 the feasibility study, all studies should be done prior to mm -hmm. really conducting the construction, but construction right. already started. Mm -hmm. However, though, the, uh, the downhill ski runs, mm -hmm. the, perhaps that what I hear is the Muzu has the facility which certainly fit into the requirement of mm -hmm. the IOC. And now here in the uh, Pyeongchang, we need to build new one and destroy the uh, environment where that the mountain has uh, over 600 years history and trees, all that, that need to be uh, damaged. So it is certain <coughs> things that we need to really re-examine as what Professor said, inviting mm -hmm. the civic groups as well as the environmental sure. specialists to, to see what kind of damage, how much of damage mm -hmm. it will occur. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we really wanted to mm -hmm. check again. Okay. Well, I guess there is really no stopping. I mean, we can minimize, but uh, there is no stopping uh, from the hosting the games and uh, protecting the environment here. But now, not only on the environment, but also some sort of uh, social rift or political rift that we've seen in previous examples of uh, host nations. Take a look at this uh, video clip, if we may. Uh, some people have said sacrifices needed to make needed to be made for mega events like World Cup or. Um, Olympic Games and uh, take a look at uh, what's what happened with the Brazil World Cup um, some years ago that protesters took to the streets pointing out that people were living in extreme poverty next to this very expensive nice looking stadiums so what are your thoughts on this is this a sacrifice that we just need to somehow bear like for example the debt after the games who is going to answer for that uh, I think it's because of the you know the feeling of deprived, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it's a it's a matter of how to manage uh, and uh, who is involved in the you know the management. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, f for instance, uh, as I said, um, if we let uh, civic organizations or civic monitoring group involved in decision making process or in management process, mm -hmm. then they can mon monitor what's going on mm -hmm. in the dis you know in a circle right so uh, they can monitor and they can um, you know s suggest it, suggest it, you know good idea you know better idea to share the benefits and the profits with the public mm -hmm. without it i think uh, you know the private company they all pers pursue profits exactly. it's you know capitalism mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. uh, i believe you know involving uh, civic groups mm -hmm. in the decision-making uh -huh. process, mm -hmm. even in relation to economic aspect, mm -hmm. that's the first step mm -hmm. to uh, to uh, protect mm -hmm. our society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. We got to looking at the two aspect. One is uh, competing priorities, mm -hmm. and the second one is the the opportunity for developing infrastructure, which is already needed, but by hosting the big sports event mm -hmm. like Olympic Games certainly give the legitimacy as well as the resources to develop these already needed mm -hmm. infrastructures for the country or for the reason. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, exactly. Now entities like the IOC or FIFA for the World Cup make money from broadcast rights and um, advertising. TV rights. TV rights. Uh, maybe you can tell us, Mr. Kim, as a former uh, vice president of the IOC, do you think this is a valid point to raise how IOC is making a lot of money when we're looking at a massive amount of debt for host, host countries or cities? 
Well, well IOC uh, makes money, you said, but uh, their work. income would be from TV right, mm -hmm. uh, sponsorship, licensee, supplier, etc. But uh, also, uh, but a lot of those monies would be only 10% uh, would go to uh, IOC right. funds, but mm -hmm. the rest of them will be all divided to uh, 205 National Olympic Committees and uh, mm -hmm. international federations and for athletes. Mm -hmm. So uh, you cannot ask for more money. Eh? Mm, okay. Already they said they would give uh, $850 million to Pyeongchang mm -hmm. from their joint Olympic sponsorship marketing mm -hmm. and $1 billion to uh, Tokyo. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are getting a lot uh, for Seoul Olympics, we didn't get a penny. <laughs> oh, yes, uh, different times, I guess. Yeah. Now, we're talking about uh, Pyeongchang uh, 2018 Winter Olympic Games here, and we're connecting now to Mr. Terence Burns, a sports consultant who is actually the speech coach for the Pyeongchang Olympic Bid Committee to hear more about uh, <coughs> successfully hosting the Olympics. Uh, hello, Mr. Burns. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, you were the talent behind the presentations by Kim Yeon and Na Sing Yeon and the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics bid that many give a lot of credit for uh, making this bid a successful one. Remind us, what kind of goal or slogan or campaign did Pyeongchang emphasize the most back then? Well, our tagline and our creative uh, positioning in the bid was something called New Horizons. It was something that I created uh, when I began working for the bid in 2009, and uh, our team was responsible for the bid strategy, the positioning, the messaging, but we also did all the presentations, as you as you noted there. And yes, I uh, I worked closely with Yuna. I wrote her speeches and trained her, as well as Chairman Cho and Teresa Ra and all the other people on the bid team. It was a great experience. Certainly, you have a lot of uh, experience in terms of hosting big sporting events as the organizers uh, prepare for the 2018 Winter Olympic Games in Pyeongchang. What sort of uh, role models should they look at? Uh, I think it's hard to pick a single role model. You have to look at a lot of the great Olympic Games in the past. The most recent really successful games was probably London 2012. They had a great leadership uh, team headed by Lord Co. They did an excellent job of addressing all the Olympic stakeholders in the Olympic movement. And, and by stakeholders, I'm referring not only to the IOC, but to the athletes themselves, to the National Olympic Committees, international federations, sponsors, media, spectators. All of those stakeholders have their own needs at the Games. And, and London did a wonderful job on that. That's a functional piece of hosting the Games. The emotional piece, what makes the Games so memorable, what they did so well is they remembered that the Olympic Games are really a party. They're the, they're the largest party in the world where we celebrate, frankly, humanity. We celebrate who we are and what we are. It just happens to be in the guise of sport. So if I'm Pyeongchang, I need to remember that it is a party. We need to have a good time. And you can also look back at Lillehammer in 1994, which was a long time ago. And the Games were much smaller in those days. But what they were able to do was to create a, a sense of coziness in a very intimate games where people were very, very friendly with each other. Uh, the Winter Games are much smaller than the Summer Games. And during the, the Pyeongchang bid, that was one of our messaging, one of our messages around Alpensia, how beautiful that is, and how we would have a very cozy, intimate games in, in Pyeongchang. So I hope that they remember that and that they uh, try to replicate that in 2018. I look forward to being there to see it. All right, great, uh, Mr. Burns. Uh, thank you so much. Got to leave it there. Great uh, conversation. Really appreciate it. Now, uh, as Mr. Burns just put it, uh, he called it a party uh, that we're going to have in 2018. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about a lot of worrisome elements in the beginning, but uh, there are certainly positives of holding events, uh, sporting events like this here in Korea. What are they? I already told you that uh, mm -hmm. it's it's more than money mm -hmm. hosting than Olympic money. Games mm -hmm. is, uh, and uh, I also said that you have to arouse uh, national enthusiasm mm -hmm. as a national uh, events. <clears throat> then uh, you could really start uh, marketing. You could collect better 
sponsorship or donations and so on. Mm -hmm. Without it, just uh, bickering each other between this and that entity, our name, uh, wouldn't reach us uh, anywhere. Okay, and uh, Professor? The Seoul Olympic mm -hmm. Games, mm -hmm. as well as, uh, you know, 2002 World, World Cup. Mm -hmm. um, these two mega events uh, certainly contribute, um, you know, social harmonization. Uh, I know there is a criticism as well. However, um, the, there is a premise, you know, if we have uh, some, some kind of fruit, you know, like a har harmonization, <coughs> uh, we <coughs> need to reach uh, consensus as well first. You know, that's uh, I already uh, mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, provide grounds for, uh, providing grounds for discussion first. That's the first step for a con consensus. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we can uh, take advantage of, um, you know, to resist uh, diverse negatives like, uh, you know, uh, populism and bullying and alienation and disrespect and so forth. Mm. So a consensus, that's the uh, uh, best strategy. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, this kind of talk is very uh, timely mm. and appropriate. Mm for uh, all of us to, uh, you know, in the, in the aspect, you know, we have a chance to talk about ourselves, our society, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, sports event. Mm -hmm. Now, we're talking about PyeongChang 2018 Olympic Winter Games and how to make this event a success and a boon for the country. And joining us uh, this, uh, for this conversation is a renowned futurist, Thomas Frey, Executive Director of the Da Vinci Institute. Mr. Frey, great to have you with us today. In your view, what would be some of the positives that Korea can take away from hosting the Games, say maybe seeing some kind of ripple effects by uh, showing its prowess and IT capabilities to PyeongChang? Well, part of what people are expecting is that the, uh, uh, South Korea is one of the most advanced, technologically advanced societies in the world. And so that people are going to expect uh, all kinds of interesting technology uh, being used in this uh, this event. This would include everything from monitoring all of the athletes that are there so that we're having uh, biometric readings on the TV screens to show everything from heartbeats per minute to the breaths that they're taking to how much oxygen they're consuming, things like that. And these are... Um, these are technologies that are already available, but having them used in kind of in this capacity is a little bit new and different. Um, and so uh, ramping up for things like this and then being able to have uh, very good communication, being able to um, have flying drones that fly over and get unique views of the athletes as they're, uh, uh, as they're coming down the ski slope or coming, coming off the ski jump. Um, these are all things I think that people will um, are, are kind of looking forward to. All right, drones for a ski games, so that would be kind of cool. Now, what kind of advice or tips can you give to the PyeongChang uh, Olympic Committee in terms of ways to maintain its sports uh, facilities and infrastructure after the games end? Um, South Korea has already become one of the, the leaders in the world in video gaming tournaments. Um, it's one of the big issues in creating Olympic facilities is what to do with all these facilities after uh, the games are all over. And using these for um, video game tournament centers might be one possible use. Uh, I think it has some interesting possibilities and, um, and, and certainly you already have the culture that's, that's ready to capitalize on that. So I think that that's, uh, could be a wonderful possibility. All right, Mr. Frey, thank you so much for uh, sharing your thoughts with us today, Mr. Frey there. Now, uh, obviously, we're going to talk about to what kind of uh, positives that we're going to have 
with us, with Korea, with Pyeongchang after the game's end. And we're going to talk about human resources development in the field of sports. And I'm sure you have a lot to say mm -hmm. about this. Korea, I mean, we do have great athletes. Mm -hmm. So we are strong in that area. But then not so much progress in terms of cultivating the sports industry. Do mm -hmm. you agree? Um, have you heard of a NEST be before? NEST. Uh, NEST really. is, uh, you know, uh, abbrevi abbreviated mm -hmm. title of uh, Korea Foundation for Next Generation Sports Talent. Uh -huh. uh, they used to call it NEST. Okay, let's, uh -huh. uh, let's call it NEST. Okay, we have a NEST established in uh, 2007. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's founded uh, on 2007 to foster uh, diverse mm -hmm. sports experts. Mm -hmm. And uh, NEST, uh, let's, let's make a list. Let me tell you the list of what NEST have done so mm -hmm. far. Uh, workshop, inviting overseas excellent leaders, global sports talent develop development, and sports specialized schools support, mm -hmm. and so forth. And there are a lot of programs they are running. However, uh, what is needed at this point is uh, systemization mm -hmm. and the consistency. Mm -hmm. and they provided many programs and uh, so many uh, sports uh, st stars and uh, players, they participated in the program. However, uh, what they did after, after the, you know, participating in the programs mm -hmm. is nothing, mm -hmm. which means they need to get a job in, in the same field, what they have done in the programs. However, it's very tough for them mm -hmm. to have a job uh, in the related fields. Mm -hmm. It's because of the program is not that much is specific and uh -huh. not that much consistent mm -hmm. to develop their, you know, each individual's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, career mm -hmm. and expertise. That's yes. the, uh, that's the, you know, that's the prob problematic mm -hmm. so far. Mm -hmm. And uh, one more thing, and the atmosphere in NEST as well as in uh, ministry, ministry of the upper uh, organization, mm -hmm. Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism, mm -hmm. The ad in, in, in those uh, organizations, the ad atmosphere is like, a, you know, pushing the personnel, okay, to have, a, let's have a short-term achievement, oh. as I said, as I said before with, uh, you know, Olympic, uh, I mean, you know, IOC. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to uh, step back at this point, step back and look into the program, review the program mm -hmm. and refine the program and take a look at and, and focusing on consistency and uh, you know, um, uh, detail. Mm. That's the uh, first step we need to do so far. Mm. Uh, you know, at this point, mm -hmm. instead of just you know pursuing uh, short-term achievement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So I guess we all agree on the theme of consistency, the, mm -hmm. the need for system, mm -hmm. uh, system and consistency in mm -hmm. terms of uh, nurturing these uh, new talent. Now, uh, we've had a pretty good run so far on this uh, topic. Now, I want to wrap this up and get your final thoughts on what we can do, what South Korea can do from here on to make the 2018 Pyeongchang Olympic Games a success. And I want to start off with you, Mr. Well, Kim. I will tell you two sides. One mm -hmm. intangible, which means that the one of the most important values mm -hmm. Olympic has is educating youth. Mm -hmm. So I hope that Korea can show the, our Korean youth that the country, this nation can have a capacity mm -hmm. to learn successful Winter Olympic Games, mm -hmm. also providing the whole facilities for winter the games for our youth. The second part is our the innovative, creative, the IT technology and the medical technology can use this Winter Olympic to develop a more wearable the diagnostic, the clothes and right. other facilities mm -hmm. programs. Therefore, we can really show the world after the game that we created this because of mm -hmm. this successful Winter Olympic Games. And drones mm -hmm. for the ski slopes, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Professor Cho. Um, uh, there are two parts, I think. Um, infrastructure, which is uh, hardware. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, on pro it's in progress. So I, I would say, okay, it's fine. However, we need to uh, you know, emphasize or focus on rather um, software mm -hmm. uh, ideas, you know, how to uh, develop ideas, how to incubate ideas in relation to e you know, economy, 
as well as uh, you know, management itself. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would say, um, let's just you know, be open to, um, to include more people into uh, Winter Olympic Games, you know, Pyeongchang Olympic Games. Mm. That's the, uh, I think, uh, most critical step I we see. need to do at this point. Okay, all right. And Mr. Kim? Organization of any such event has two aspects. One is organization of the games. Mm -hmm. One is uh, accomplishment by country's team players, ah. okay? Otherwise, people will not support or follow. Mm -hmm. Okay, and also uh, at this time, I said it's more than just economic or local interest. It's a national, international event, a festival. Okay, uh, at this time, they have got the games uh, four years ago and already preparation started. A little bit delayed and then IOC is giving a lot of pressure. We have to somehow organize one of the best games ever, as they did with the Seoul Olympics. Mm -hmm. So they have to uh, reorient their plans realistically and negotiate with IOC and implement. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they have to train and uh, operate uh, the events and games as best as they could, and then establish good international relations and leave good legacy mm -hmm. of the uh, Olympic, which will include mm -hmm. post-games usage of this huge, uh, numerous facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, we could think of uh, letting Gangwon province local people or Korean people or tourist people use these facilities, but, uh, you know, population of Gangwon is uh, not more than 1.7 uh, or something. Mm -hmm. uh, our finance is quite limited. We have to attract tourists, uh, sports people, uh, uh, encourage uh, tourism uh, in Nagawan province, which has huge potential. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to do all these things, but eventually, uh, two was best games ever, and leave good legacy for the world. Mm, good legacy, and hopefully we can all have a party there in Pyeongchang in 2018. Thank you so much for uh, coming in today and going up front on this thank topic. You. Thank you. And of course, a thank you, our viewers, for staying with our Upfront conversation as well. Remember, you can stay with Upfront online as well. I will see you next time.